classify ice by its age, because the age of ice makes all the difference as to how hard it is, how difficult it is to break, and how much damage it will do to your ship. First year, ice, that means ice formed in one winter. It's, it's formed, and it stays first year ice from the time it's formed right through to the next melt season, so it's through one winter. By definition, it is 30 centimeters thick to up to two meters plus. First year ice cannot get to more, I'm talking about level ice forming without deformation, cannot get to much more than about two meters. Because once it's formed on the surface, and it gets snow on it and everything else, it now insulates the water beneath it, so it cannot get any thicker. So thick first year ice, we like to recognize it because we know it's not much more than two meters thick maybe two and a half meters maximum. So we don't mind clattering full speed into thick first year. You'll get a bump, might throw you out of bed, <laughs> might spill your coffee, but it will not damage an icebreaker. Then you can back into it. Thick first year ice is very unlikely to damage a propeller. So all ice is divided into two sections, second year ice and multi-year. Now, second year ice is ice over three meters thick, which has survived one melt season. In fact, it doesn't have to be over three meters. It's ice, significant ice which has survived one melt season. And the melt season in the Northern Hemisphere is 31st October. So all of a sudden, all the significant ice that is still there floating around on 31st October, anywhere in the Arctic, suddenly has a birthday, becomes second year. It may or may not be dangerous, but we assume now it is second year, it is dangerous. It will change its appearance during the melt season. It will have erosion on the surface. You'll see water courses develop. You'll see drainage systems. You'll see all the hummocks and uh, uh, distortions to it being rounded down by the melting process. The salt will leach out of it will be replaced by fresh water ice that has dripped, filled all those uh, uh, little holes left by the salt, will turn into brine and will return to the ocean. The snow will have melted off it and filled all those holes with fresh ice. The crystalline structure will have changed and it will now appear to be green rather than white. That's how we can tell the second year flow is it's greenish color, it's not white. The older flows are blue. And it's all because of the crystalline structure which changes the way light is refracted through it. That is hard stuff, difficult to break, not impossible. Another way you can tell second year or old ice, it rides higher out of the water because it's less dense. It's thicker, but it's less dense, so the freeboard is higher, and it tends to break in straight lines. You see little cliffs building along the water's edge. The first year ice breaks in a ragged fashion, sort of haphazard. Now multi-year is the next stage and that is if it survived two melt seasons or more. Sometimes it's 5, 10, 30, 40 years old. Depends where it comes from. It doesn't matter. If it's three years old, we do not ever mess with old multi-year ice. So we uh, look for that. It's blue. It shatters the same way in uh, straight lines. It's very rounded, has very well developed drainage systems. And ice of land origin doesn't even have a code number. Ice at land origin is icebergs. We do not even count them. We don't include them in our code because icebergs have a life of their own, a mind of their own, and they come off the glaciers all the time. And they drift around in well-known areas. When you're within a limit that icebergs are known, you should expect to see them. Nobody has ever tried to break an iceberg. The Titanic had a go at it, but it didn't work. And so we just ignore the fact that there are icebergs. We don't put them on our charts. We don't put them on our ice maps. And uh, if we've done our homework, we know to expect them. So to talk about icebreaker technology, what makes an icebreaker different from any other vessel today. So I thought it would be just as good idea, just as well, to start with this one. This is the one you're most familiar with. Uh, some of you may have set it on the Drenitsin, which is a sister ship to this one, or one of the nuclear icebreakers, Yamal, Soviet to Soyuz, which are quite, quite different. But the first question I always get from people, most people, is 
how did they modify this ship to carry passengers? What, how different is she from when she was a working icebreaker? The short answer, practically no modifications. She is the way she was built. Externally, the only thing you can see different is we have four lifeboats before she had two. And then out of the way, we'll start talking about what makes icebreakers different, and we'll deal with this one. This is a very standard type icebreaker. Now the upper deck here, bow comes down, then it comes at a steep angle, it goes back, you have basically the hull, stern, this, triple screws, wing screws out here, a center screw in the recess, then a huge rudder sticking out like that. The rudders on icebreakers are enormous because they have to, to affect an awful lot of pressure on the water. And uh, the propellers are not protected in any way. They stick out into the ice. <clears throat> the only feature back here that is different to another ship is what's called an ice horn, which comes down very close to the rudder, and it breaks ice with that rather than breaking the rudder. It's waterline. Now when the ship is breaking ice, if the ice is more than two meters thick, she will ride up and she'll break it down there by the weight of the ship. This is called the stopper or the ice knife. We do not want the ship to ride right up on the ice because if she's supported on a single point there, she will flip over, she capsize. She needs to be supported all around by the water so she cannot, if she feet finds a piece of ice which you cannot break and which was thick enough to support the ship, and some of this ice out here is, it will either break the ice there or it will stop it. So that is a feature and you'll see it on the plans around the ship, you see the profiles of the ship, you'll always see that little bit sticking down. The stem here is what takes most of the punishment. This is a solid piece of steel, 21 inches deep. Uh, on my little ship, 15,000 horsepower of the Renaissance. We were heading up the St. Lawrence River off the city of Trois-Rivières, doing full speed, uh, 16 knots. I had a catastrophic failure of my steering gear, hard over to starboard. I went 17 feet into a dock, including a cement dock, including two railway lines, and we didn't even bend it. <laughs> they are strong. <laughs> the plates all fit into, into this. And uh, this is actually one solid piece, but the rest is welded around it. Then inside you have very heavy frames. You have a collision bulkhead. The ship is divided into watertight compartments, which is double bottom. These are tanks all the way along. So the fuel tanks, water tanks, all sorts of ballast tanks, all sorts of tanks. She's subdivided into watertight compartments. Which those of you on the engine room tour have seen doors in them, odd places. Those doors can be controlled from the bridge, from the engine room, or at the door. She's what they call a one compartment ship, though she has seven. Why call it a one compartment ship? Because you can puncture and flood any one of these compartments, and she will stay afloat provided you close the doors. That's all you have to do. And those doors will cut you in half if you have to be stood inside one when it's closing. So we try to avoid standing in them when they're closing. Um, if two compartments should be damaged, flooded, supposing you were hit right on a bulkhead, and you close the doors, she will stay afloat provided you do something. You have to start pumping, you have to transfer ballast, you have to do something to prevent any further ingress. If you should puncture three, which is highly unlikely, it's time to get off. You cannot save that ship. So. Uh, that's, what, that's how every ship actually is divided into watertight compartments. It doesn't matter what kind of a ship it is, but on an icebreaker, you have more possibility of damage from ice, therefore you usually have more watertight bulkheads and smaller compartments. This collision bulkhead is extremely solid and there are no doors in it. A we could ram head on into an iceberg and smash this back flat and she would still stay afloat. Now on the hull, we have these uh, little holes just below the waterline. 
So we can push compressed air out of. Those are called a bubbler system. The bubbles come up underwater and they lubricate the ice alongside the ship. It makes it more slippery, so she will go through. In minus 40 degrees, that is a very, very useful system because the water is liquid long enough to lubricate the ice, especially when you have snow from the ice, which is very sticky, that will wash it off. You can also use those as thrusters. We can blow the ship sideways, but only in open water. We also have uh, other systems to help. Uh, icebreaker looking down on the this way. Spell. We have three sets of tanks, ballast tanks on either side, two or three on either side. They contain 600 tons of salt water. They're connected by enormous main with a fan in the middle. Each one holds 200 tons. Each pair holds 200 tons. <coughs> And we can blow that water from side to side in 60 seconds. And we can make the ship roll 11 degrees every minute. And then when, when she's really stuck in the ice, you give her a few heaves, either way, and she comes loose, the hull is lubricated again, and uh, she will move forward or extract. We also have tanks at each end. Between them, they carry 800 tons. They have a long main connecting them with a pump. And we can move that water from one end to the other. It takes a little longer, 15 minutes. And we can change the trim of the ship. I've already mentioned about sailing with the bow down in uncharted waters, so you'll strike with the bow first. Um, if you notice that the hull is black and below it is red. Now that red paint is slippery paint. It's like Teflon. It's non-stick. It costs a fortune to put on the ship, about a quarter of a million dollars to do, but it lasts almost forever below. Heavy steel, full of machinery, lots of fuel, ballast water, heating tanks and all that. And so she's like one of those little toys that you can't knock over. They the head and they snap back. That's what an icebreaker does. So by putting a little bit of some extra weight up here in the house and making it nice and high, you reduce that. You make the ship feel more tender. Instead of being stiff, she becomes tender and it dampens the roll a bit. But you never think it crossing the southern ocean on a ship like this, 35 degrees in 21 seconds. Aye. That is violent. I've seen people actually leave the deck in the wheelhouse and fly across to the other side. In fact, the dent of the head of one of them is still in the bulkhead on the port side. Um, I can show you that on the bridge tour. Um, so icebreakers are inherently extremely stable and uh, it would be almost impossible to capsize. Uh, another reason we want a nice high bridge is, you've all noticed it yourself, so we can see what's going on up front. Uh, because it is a working engine room, we will find people working here and there. So please don't get in their way, don't get in their face taking flash pictures or something. They may be doing precision work in a, in a workshop. They may have their tools spread out on the deck. Please don't walk through their tools and walk around them follow the recommendations. There are steep ladders, steep ladders, some of them three stories high. Please hold the rails going up and down. If we hit a hard, hard block of ice, they can throw you off that ladder. So uh, please hang on to the handle. She's diesel electric. She has six big diesel propulsion motors, which each one drives a generator. Each one is 4,000 horsepower. So the six of those add up to the 24,000 horsepower we have. Propulsion is electric and it's completely separate from any other electrics in the ship. It's DC. This switchboard here is all propulsion motors only. The rest of the ship is AC, or what we call the hotel load, the lights, the heating, the cranes, the, machine, the equipment on board, navigational instruments, that's AC. We have five separate generators that run that. We only use two at a time. The other three are on standby or on maintenance. And uh, if the load gets too heavy, we're using a crane, another one will cut in. That switchboard is all that part. So we have central, two central power stations, one for propulsion alone to drive the ship, the other for everything else. Uh, <clears throat> the main propulsion engines are virtually locomotive engines. They're slow revving um, uh, diesels, nine cylinders. They use heavy fuel mixed with diesel, which is unobtainable up here. There is no refueling possibility fuel has to last for the whole season. 
Each one burns 13 tons a day. If you ran all six, we'd have 38 days supply. She's out for 90 days to 100 days, so we do never run all six. We just use the number of engines we need to keep within the consumption. Um, she's triple screw, so we have three propulsion motors. So each motor has two generators. And we can use one on each or two on each, but we can use no more. We can't put a third one onto any motor. Each motor is 7,000 horsepower. If you're used to the quarter horsepower motor in your fridge, these are bigger. You all heard about the sanitary system. I'll go into it a little deeper. Well, we won't go into it deeper. <laughs> uh, under international maritime law nowadays, you are not allowed to dispose of sewage overboard. So we do not. We have two systems. One is called the grey water system, in which all your bath water and your sinks and so on goes into this. It's filtered once goes overboard. Your toilets goes into a totally separate system, to a holding tank. Solid material is, is extracted from that, mixed with diesel oil, and burned in the incinerator. The water, the liquid content, is filtered three times. It then goes into the grey water system, is filtered again, and goes overboard pure. So it is not ships who are polluting the oceans, it's cities. Because all ships have to have this system now. To make that system work, chemicals, we have to use fresh water to flush. We cannot use seawater. In the old time ships, you can just flush as long as you want it. Now we have a vacuum system to suck that material down. It uses only a liter of water, a liter and a quarter of fresh water every time you pull that little knob. She can carry 2,500 tons of fresh water, which she does. She brings with it from Vladivostok uh, or wherever she started the voyage. And that is to make up any deficit that the evaporators cannot handle when the ship when I first came on the ship in 92, we only had evaporators, and we made 30 tons of water a day. The trouble with passengers is who keep taking baths, whether they need them or not, and laundry, we were using 60 tons a day, twice as much as we could make. Therefore, we had a deficit of 30 tons a day, and every day, we, by the time we got to the end of the trip, there was no reserve left. Since then, they've gone to reverse osmosis, which is a much uh, better system much more rapid, does not require so much fuel to evaporate the water, but you don't evaporate it anymore, you push it through a membrane, and we can make 60 tons a day, just about our consumption. So it's not so much a problem as it used to be, but we always have to think about it, especially because these toilets use fresh water. Laundry is the killer. If you didn't do any laundry, you can save an almost a tremendous amount of water. This is the towing winch for towing other ships. This big wire on here is 450 ton braking strain. It's 500 meters long. That wire by itself, just the 500 meters of it, is worth about $100,000. So they don't want to break it. Thank you.